Welcome to the Miniatures Paintbrush. Today we're going to do part three of the three part series of the Mortis Engine. We're finally finishing up, and here's the home stretch. Enjoy! back for part three of the three-part series of the mortise engine here what we're going to do is going to build a base we start with some cork and then I use these uh, I ordered them from uh, let's see green stuff world they had that on the site somewhere and I was just like I think I did a good a quick search for uh, tombstones um, these are a little big for my taste Personally, so I'm looking for smaller ones. I don't know if there's any 3d printers around my area I would like to uh, would Like to play around with uh, setting up some um, Gravestones for me since I have a death army. I think that would be appropriate um, I decided that I want to put a river in uh, the middle of the base and I wanted to have levels of uh, rock come up. So I cut these out of cork that I had. And you can order these cork sheets just about anywhere, uh, really. Uh, I think I got these from Walmart when I went to Walmart. And uh, they were there. And what I'm using is hot glue. Um, I'm using the ultimate glue gun that I got from uh, AC Moore and uh, I got it at a discount. I think I got it for 12 bucks total. It's after all the discounts. It starts at uh, 30. Uh, right here, I'm just trying to figure out where I want the tombstone. So you play around with ideas. And this is how you develop, or how I develop uh, a scenery. I play around with ideas. I see what they look like and I see what I like. I mean, there's no right or wrong in my opinion. There's what you like and what you don't like. So, you know, hopefully you can get what you like. Um, so over here I drew out where I want the river so I can get a better uh, idea of where I want that and space out the items accordingly. There you go to the end before I glue them down and I'm going to glue them down to the base. Now I use the hot glue gun to glue them down. Oh, wait a second. First off I wanted to see what it would look like and if it would fit. Uh, so I take the mortise engine in the bottom and see if it fits. Um, and that is a green light go. Uh, I dry fit a lot, I know, and it's always better safe than sorry, you know, measure twice, cut once, so I'm like, measure 15 billion times, that's an exaggeration, measure many, many times, and then um, glue once. So I use the uh, glue gun for this. Now what this does though, uh, when you're gluing this stuff with a glue gun, is it's, it leaves a gap sometimes, so be very, very careful, uh, and especially since I'm working with uh, wet, I'm working with uh, scenic, Woodland Scenic's uh, Realistic Water, and I didn't realize that there was going to be a gap there, and it's it started leaking out the first time I did it, so I had like a big, big accident. So you see how you have this wood filler right here? Now this is something I didn't do, and so you won't have an accident, is that um, once you use the wood filler, um, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to um, you're going to definitely want to uh, just make sure that you have uh, paste on the bottom and surrounding the bottom areas of that uh, piece. I guess the uh, gosh the corking on the bottom. So I didn't do that at first, so just make sure you have that in there if you're going to use realistic water. If you're not going to use realistic water, honestly, I really didn't have uh, much of a challenge to put all the other basting on there uh, without, you know, filling in the gaps on the bottom. But if you do, just, you know, on the bottom uh, seal, make a seal where the water might seep through because when it comes to realistic water uh, and water in general, uh, there's a path of least resistance that it's going to want to take. And the path of least resistance is usually seeping through the bottom if there are any gaps. <laughs> I found that out the hard way. Now you see, you see, you see there on the bottom, I didn't fill in the gap. 
Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. And that's towards the bottom uh, edges along the bottom of the, uh, the big rock formation right there. And I put this uh, wood filler, I put it around uh, the, the edges because I didn't want the, I guess the cork to uh, show through and make it look like cork. I wanted to avoid that as much as possible. And there are some certain edges where jagged and I kind of just like left it. So it was like just willy nilly, kind of just throwing it each way, any way I want to throw it around and, and you know, play around with stuff. I don't like getting my hands dirty, which is ironic because I'm always getting my hands dirty anyway. But I don't like getting my hands dirty, so I kind of wear a glove to do this. Uh, if you're like me and don't like getting your hands too dirty, uh, wear a glove too. If not, uh, it's your prerogative to wear gloves or not wear gloves. or It's up to you. Uh, wood filler doesn't hurt, but I do recommend washing your hands before you know eating any finger foods. Not eating any fingers because that would be really weird. Hmm. No, cannibalism is definitely not my thing. Clarice? Anyway, so that wood filler is great to have on hand, and if you're doing terrain, it, it really does come in handy uh, as um, as leveling things out and using things, uh, especially big areas where you want to use rock or anything like that. You can just smooth it out with your finger. Uh, later on, I do use different products uh, to simulate rock, but this is definitely a great starting point. Just make sure that everything is dry before you continue uh, to use or, or build up or paint or anything like that. Uh, for the most part, you can sand this stuff, um, but no major sanding. I wouldn't majorly sand it. Like if I wouldn't start putting, uh, like trying to shave down too much because I really didn't put a little a uh, big layer of it on. I didn't really pack it on. And uh, if I were to sand it down, it would go straight down to the caulking. And I don't know if I want that. Now, if you want a very, very smooth area uh, where it's completely flat, this will fill in the gaps of the cork. Cork. <laughs> so it would be smooth if you wanted to. Now, as I put this up, um, I, I posted it online where I had some painters that motivated me and painters motivating painters, uh, Google Plus form from Vince Ventrilla, and uh, they told me that it, it was too smooth, <laughs> which I really didn't pick up on. You see, the thing about working with this stuff, you're, I mean, I'm pretty too close. I think I'm too close to the actual piece that I'm creating that I don't see too many errors. And sometimes you need to step back or get somebody else's opinion or, you know, uh, just get inspiration from somebody else so you know where you stand and where you'd want to improve upon. It's hard to look at something and look at something for hours upon hours and then get an objective opinion about it. But if you put it out there, uh, with like-minded people that are really willing just to help you, then I find that objective opinion really does help. So, there I am, uh, just putting more wood filler in wherever I feel necessary on all the edges and wiping off the excess right there. Um, this is the first time I've ever used wood filler, so uh, this is another first. For me, I, I did a lot of firsts. Whenever I build a model, the newest model that I build, I always try to, you know, do something different that I've never done before and explore a new avenue. And uh, this this one, it definitely, it was fun to work with the wood filler for the first time and seeing the characteristics of it. Uh, I think next time I, would, I just wouldn't be so careful with uh, taking off the excess. Uh, but at this point, the reason why I took off the excess was because I didn't know where I wanted to go with it, like what kind of formations of rock that I wanted to put in there. Because right now, it just looks like one thing stacked on top of the other. And what you really want to do, and like in natural, um, in natural, in nature, you're not going to have like a uh, clear cliff uh, progression. And it's not going to look too clean. Uh, I, my thought here was to use rocks to variate some, some of the, the textures there, but it wasn't enough. Like towards the edge of uh, cliffs and stuff like that, usually there is a lip, and I didn't create the lip there. So this is when uh, most of it was dry. I think the only wet part I put was the back. I allowed the front part to dry. I started sanding it just a little just to get it smooth here and there. Again, I didn't go too deep with the sanding because uh, I didn't want to go all the way down to the uh, caulk, the caulking, cork board. 
uh, I mean, working with corkboard was fun, um, being that it was the first time that I ever did it on a base. Uh, that was fun too. Um, <clears throat> Just remember with uh, the ultimate glue gun that you're going to have to unplug it. There's no on or off switch. There are other glue guns that have on and off switch, and I think they're neat. I like this one because I can set the temperature uh, high or low, and I can manipulate it to depending on which project that I do. Um, if you put it at a higher temperature, it takes a little longer to dry, but if you have sensitive objects, it'll melt them. So you may want to have that uh, lower setting as an option. So the one thing about working with wood is that it crumbles, that wood filler, it crumbles, so you have to be careful to wipe it all down because whatever you leave up on the uh, the base and you paint is going to crumble away. Okay, so next up, what I did was, is I was going to work on the tombstone. I'm working on the tombstone, I, I cut it out and I am filing off all the uh, mold lines that I see. And I'm just trying to place it, I still haven't figured out where I wanted to put it just yet. Uh, I know that the mortise engine was going to go on top, and I didn't know if there was enough room or what was going to be on top. So I try to measure at this point the center line of the base uh, so I know which direction the mortise engine is going in, where I should place it, and, you know, just the, basically the symmetry of the base. And the reason the symmetry of the base is concerned, naturally, you're going to want uh, objects on both sides of that line to be equal in a sense. So you don't want your eye drawn to just one side of the miniature and not the other one. So if you're going to build up one side, you kind of have to want to put items on the other side to kind of balance it out. If not, it's just going to look lopsided. Uh, even if the miniature is straight, it's still going to look lopsided because you have more on one side than the other. So your eye kind of draws to one side. And unless that is your focal point for the entire miniature, I don't really recommend that and try to balance it out with different features. So now I'm playing around with a putty. It's called Milliput. And this is your standard Milliput. They also sell fine Milliput, which I do not have currently. But this is an epoxy putty, just like uh, green stuff, Nidatite, that I've been working with before. Uh, I want to kind of finish that Milliput out because I started a long time ago, and I don't want it to, um, to go bad. And it's already starting to turn colors. And the only way to really save uh, any kind of epoxy putty like this is that if you have extra ones, you got to put it in a freezer bag, take all the oxygen you possibly can out of it, and throw it in your freezer. And what it does is it slows down the uh, degradation of the two-part epoxy, and it should last virtually your lifetime if you lift it in there. Um, because even out in the air, it'll last years and years. So if you put it in the freezer with the freezer bag, it'll last decades and decades. You can imagine. Uh, so... If you have additional uh, epoxy putties and you're just using one and you're not going to really transition between one and the other and the other and the other uh, and you want to preserve them, put it in that freezer bag, take all the oxygen out and leave it in their freezer and make sure that the family does not uh, get to it. Okay, so with the milliput, what I'm doing is I'm sculpting a ridge to where the lake, uh, the undead lake is going to be. So I wanted to uh, form some barriers so this way not to allow any of the water to seep through to the other side of that base and trying to shape out the actual river. It's fun working with Milliput. Um, I find, let me see, I use Nidatite. Nidatite is super sticky. Milliput is super squishy where uh, pieces of it will come off onto your finger and dry onto your finger and then, you know, that's pretty much where it's going to stay for a while. Uh, you'd have to scrape it off and it gets them inside your fingernails and it's a lot softer in my opinion. I don't know if that's a correct adjective, but it just feels that way to me. That's a lot softer. It's sort of like when you add the epoxy um, aves to things, it softens it up. It makes it really, really soft. Uh, and that's something you may want to use to work with. It's up to you. When working with epoxy putties, really, it's in my opinion, it's your preference what you feel comfortable working with. And each one of these epoxies have different textures and different uh, styles in which you want to work with. And I do have a video uh, detailing all the different kind of putties that you can use to sculpt. Um, so you can check within the playlists. Uh, it was a hobby tip. I know that. Uh, see if I can get the link up for you if possible. Alrighty. So, 
Now what I'm using is a sculpting tool that I picked up at my local hobby store and there was a set of them. And sculpting tools can be found in both the hobby section of let's say um, Hobby Lobby. And we'll also, you'll find them also uh, shaping tools in the actual sculpting section. So there's an actual sculpting section if you haven't seen or looked around the store. Uh, you can check out different sections. And that's one thing, if you're in a hobby store, sometimes you find your hobby related stuff in other sections in the store. One of the things that I found in another section of that store was um, stained glass painted stained glass and you can get actually the colors that are translucent that you can put on stained glass. You can also use uh, ghost tints to do stained glass. You can also use candy colors to do stained glass as well. What they also sell is uh, the lead, which looks like that leaded bead that stained glass has in between to create uh, the shards. So, and it's relatively cheap. I think it was like 10 bucks for the entire set, including the paints as well as the beads, as well as the, the faux glass that they have there. And I don't think it was real glass, I think it was more plastic, which is perfect for me, because then I could just apply it. Now that kind of plastic you can find on those clamshell packages that you have from um, those really annoying packages to open up that you need scissors. Um, speaking of which, I remember a, uh, a product specifically made to open up those clamshell packages with the see-through plastic, hard plastic that was really hard to get open. And it was in one actual clam package. So <laughs> it's like, here we're selling the tool in the clam package, but we're giving you it in the clam package. I guess that'll be the last time you'll have to struggle to open one of those things. But, you know, a sharp scissors will help. Okay, so now what I'm doing is I'm taking nails. I'm taking nails and I'm putting it through the, the uh, through the caulk and I'm pushing it down with a pair of pliers there and I'm just applying pressure. I'm not banging it like a nail would, although you could, I guess, but uh, I'm just being delicate. <laughs> All right, so I'm putting three here and one is to the left, another one's to the right and one is straight up or two of them are more straight up than the, than the last one. I wanted one to be crooked. And what this is going to represent are spikes that are going to be held in the ground. And since it has a flat head on top, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take skulls that I bought from uh, Green Stuff World and I'm going to place them or glue them on top of the nails, creating a, you know, a nice little surface for uh, spiked skulls or skulls that are on pikes. And that's exactly the look that I was going for. So again, with the balance, since I have one side of the base that is high due to having an extra small layer of caulking, giving that extra dimension, on the opposite end of the base, I wanted to put something that extruded upwards that was higher than the other side. In fact, it's actually uh, the distance, the height, with the skulls, they are higher. Although it balances out because they're on spikes instead of being a solid base. So I was playing around with a mixture and trying to even out the balance of uh, the base itself. And you do want to have that symmetry, you do want to have that balance, you just don't want to willy-nilly throughout the whole thing. Uh, you can willy-nilly when you put on the, uh, the wood filler a little bit, but don't willy-nilly through the entire thing. Uh, you may want to have some thought before you continue, like what is the end product going to be? Picture that in your head, draw it out if you want to, if that helps you. Uh, I can picture it in my head and just follow it through. And then if I need to make adjustments along the way, I just make adjustments along the way and I just don't sweat the details. If it feels right, then then I'm happy with it. And if I'm happy with it, and that's all that matters when you're hobbying. You, know, you need to be satisfied with this because ultimately it's going to be in your display case or in your house on a shelf. You're going to be looking at it on a daily basis. You're going to live with this. So you have to enjoy it. So it has to look appealing to you no matter what anybody else thinks. And if it looks appealing to you, I claim that as a major victory. All right, so it was really, really uh, 
I was really happy with the spike idea because I had bought these small uh, nails and I had no idea what I was going to do with it. And then the idea came to me while I was reading, I think it was the General's Handbook or was it the uh, Warhammer Skirmish book? And I was just reading and reading and reading and I was like, ah, the nails, I could put them as spikes for skulls. And then I was looking at and uh, reading articles, I guess it was in White Dwarf, which I've never owned until the last couple of months. Uh, I never picked up an issue of White Dwarf ever, 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 except for in the library, I saw them there and that's when I used them. But I never actually uh, bought one to take home and read. So recently I've been buying them and I've been enjoying them. And um, there's a lot of content in there. There's a lot of content in there. So there is a lot of reading. And again, uh, in the summertime, I love my reading. So I'm a readaholic, which I encourage and I hope that everyone uh, becomes addicted to reading because that's amazing. I love literacy. Go literacy. All right. <laughs> um, so once I got the skulls, again, get rid of any of the mold lines. There weren't too many, so it wasn't really a big deal. Uh, I put some super glue on there. I like to use uh, Gorilla Glue. I used to use Loctite. There's nothing wrong with Loctite, and there's nothing wrong with uh, Gorilla Glue. Um, there's nothing wrong with any super glue that I've ever met. Uh, Crazy Glue seems to be a little more liquidy. That's a word. Uh, than others, but it just depends on what you want to work with. Okay, going back to the tombstone, I kind of like it there in that position on the bottom, and that's where I ended up with it. So, after much, much debate, because I tried to put it on top, and I was like, mm, okay, let's just go for it. So I was just going back and forth with it until I just said, you know what? Glue it down, it's going to happen. It was fun to putting together this base um, because I've never done anything on this scale before. This is the biggest miniature I've ever uh, completed, ever. So I, had, I knew I had to spend time on the base and go the extra mile with a lot of the details. And as I was constructing this, the more I started getting into it, the more happy I was. The only time that I was really, really uh, disappointed was when I realized that I did not seal the bottom uh, of the bricks, of the uh, stonework, and the realistic water seeped through. I was very, very saddened by that, but it was remedied, and you know that the result was fabulous. So now what I'm doing is I'm dry fitting. Again, you want to dry fit. I dry fit multiple times, uh, and just to make sure that everything is, you know, adjacent and straight, and that looks good on the base. You don't want it crooked or anything, and that everything fits. Uh, that's a really important thing to do when you're working on bases. You want to make sure everything fits exactly where you want it to be. Now, yeah, I guess you can pin it down. And I don't like to do the bases, uh, build the miniatures on the bases, and then paint it that way. Because if I am airbrushing or painting, I kind of want it to be even going through both sides and not just one. Uh, so there was a piece there, and I wanted to create a globe, and I wanted to put the globe... Uh, that the mortise engine was coming from this globe, but I picked up something from the nursery, and when I say that, I mean the plant uh, shop, I guess, and it was it was a big scale, so it was a little too big for this uh, for this platform, so I didn't use it. So I had to come up with a solution. I, st I knew that I still wanted to use that, um, and but right now what I'm going to do is I use uh, the textured paint over there give it some grain, and then I use a Rust-Oleum camouflage to create that so it has some texture to it. So I had this idea, I had these little bricks that I had uh, picked up. Where did I pick those up from? I think they were Pegasus Hobbies, yes, Pegasus Hobbies. Uh, and you can find them on eBay, I believe. I don't know, you can find them on uh, Amazon, Pegasus Hobbies. Just take a look for Pegasus Hobbies on eBay. Uh, I keep saying that, <laughs> Pegasus Hobbies on Amazon. I say that because there was this uh, other video that I put out and I said that uh, an item was on eBay and it wasn't on eBay, it was on Amazon. Like I said it was, it was on eBay. So it was this big, whole big thing. Uh, so just do a search really quick and you can find it. If you still have problems finding uh, Pegasus Hobbies, and I, I believe they have their own website as well, 
Um, if you have a problem finding Pegasus Hobbies, let me know and I will put a link in the description so this way you could find it. Okay. Um, and these bricks are pretty awesome. The only thing about these bricks are is they're pretty soft, so you can break them really, really easily. And they're not even, which is a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing because bricks aren't usually even. Uh, it's a bad thing because you don't have any mortar to flatten out the area. So, you know, you want if you want to create a flat area, you have to choose the bricks that are appropriate that'll make a flat area for yourself. And this is time consuming. See right here, there I believe there's no glue applied. So I'm just laying the bricks down and then I put the glue in. Just to get the right size, make sure it's flat, and then I'll put the glue in. So it takes a bit of time to do this, but I think the results are worth it. At the bottom base there, I used a, uh, a plinth, is it? Uh, to simulate that it's being raised, that it's a little bit of an altar, and then the bricks to, to lift it up. I really like the way that came out. You see the bottom, the gray part is the plinth that I gotten from uh, the tombstone set Again, that I picked up from Green Stuff World. So, again, dry fit just to make sure that it fits there. I knew I wanted a globe there while wow, cutting it close, but I knew I wanted a globe there, uh, some kind of crystal ball, and I wanted the mortise engine to emerge from that crystal ball. So I had to come up with an idea of how to let like that ghostly energy uh, radiate from the ball and look like it's actually summoning the mortise engine. So that, again, I want to tell a story. I told a story with the phylactery, phylactery. I have so much trouble saying that word. I don't know. I need help. Um, phylactery. Oh, stop. I'm not going to start this again. I'm not starting this again. Okay. Um, so, you know, I came up with a way in order to do it, and which I did was I took a plant, wire. I guess there's wire that you can use. And a lot of people use that wire to create armatures uh, for miniatures and armatures for trees uh, and it's plant wire. Uh, and what I do is uh, I, my wife was selling this costume jewelry that she had had and that was broken and she was just selling it on a yard sale and never sold for a buck. And she donated it to the Munichers Paintbrush. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, thank you, Nicole. And uh, I slowly picked at it and picked it apart. And I have all the pieces of the jewelry in little baggies for terrain use whenever I need it. Now, one of these pieces was a round orb. Now, the orb had a hole through it that you can thread the jewelry piece through. And you can always get these things at your hobby store. There, you've got to go to the jewelry section. Gentlemen, man up. Go to the jewelry making section and get a whole bunch of cool stuff for your terrain and for your uh, bases. Because that jewelry stuff is pretty wicked, man. Pretty wicked. And the price is right, let me tell you. There are certain things that you can find in jewelry form that cost eight times less than you would if you bought it at a hobby store. I'll tell you right now. And all it takes is a little bit of elbow grease. Like when I took the jewelry and I took the, the round ball, all I did was I put green stuff around it and I filled it and I made it round. And then I attached it to this uh, pillar here and I actually made a orb on the top of this pillar. And that seam right there, the correct height for the pillar. And I put the orb in there and it worked out perfectly. I mean, I'm really happy. Uh, how it all turned out. So there it is. Actually building brick by brick the little tower there. Whoa. All right, move the camera around a little bit so you can get a better view of it. Kind of lower it down just a little bit so you can see how it looks like. There it is. Looks much better from this angle. Sorry for the shaky camera there. Um, just want to get a cool idea of what it looks like. Whoa, dude. I need to improve my camera stuff. That's better. Ah, oh, look. I love the angle. You can see it from this angle, and you can actually see all the details that are put in there. And I was super happy the way this turned out. I mean, it looks pretty cool for my first uh, large base. So there's the jewelry that my wife donated. Thank you very much. 
And when you have jewelry like this, uh, for some of you not not know, it's threaded, it's stitched. So there are so many things on this little piece of jewelry that I can use. There's the ball that I used for the top. And it, look at that perfect, perfect scale right there. And I was super happy. So I took my Nita tight, or green stuff. They call it green stuff because it's uh, yellow and blue. If you mix yellow and blue, it turns green. I just took a little bit of there. In fact, that's too much. And I need it, and it's very, very sticky. So you would use a modeling Vaseline uh, or a sculpting Mac Vaseline. That'll make it unsticky or less sticky, so to speak. Um, again, there goes my clumsiness. I drop it many times, and I'm really, really clumsy. So I put this together, and I'm clumsy. So if you're not clumsy, you can do something like this. Look at this. I am putting on a shell here. Okay, so if you're not clumsy, you'll do even better than I did because really, I am such a klutz. But somehow I managed to do all these things, so there you go. There's that Vaseline I was talking about. Again, I got that from Green Stuff World. I put one order for Green Stuff World with a whole bunch of stuff. And I want to make sure that everything in there fit. Um, I mean, if I'm going to order from Spain and it's going to take forever to get there, just order once and get it all out of the way. And that's my opinion. So, uh, just putting a little bit of green stuff covers up the hole where you thread it through the jewelry piece. And I don't even have to do one side of it, really, because it's the top that's going to show. The bottom is actually going to get covered with the brickwork, so you don't have to worry about that. So, I'm going to put just a drop up there on top of glue, and I'm going to set that right in there. And... The mortise engine is going to come. Now i got to make sure it's in the middle. So you make sure it's in the middle before you dry. Turn it around. Make sure it's centered from all angles. See how you turn it around? It doesn't look centered. Make sure it's centered. And as it dries, uh, as the glue dries, it makes it easier for you to manipulate and it stay in place, which is pretty cool. Once you're happy with where it is, uh, you can use some zip kicker, and that'll dry it completely so you don't mess around with moving it or dropping it or taking it out of place or accidentally bumping it like I would usually do. Really happy. Turned out really nice. There was a fingerprint there. I kind of just like wiped it off. Again, look how quickly that zip kicker kind of just dries that, that super glue. And it does it instantly so this way you're not holding on to it for a very long time. Why waste your time, right? So there it is. Uh, I do have some more Nita tight. And one of the things I was thinking about is, again, having necrotic kind of energy coming out from there. I was thinking maybe Nidatide would be a good idea to do. Uh, it There's the idea right there, it coming out from there. And I was like, well, as I was playing with the Nidatide, yeah, that could be a way of doing it, actually shaping it and then gluing it on later. But it just seemed like after a while that this method... Um, it wasn't the best method for me. Now, some people may want to work and sculpt it. Uh, if you're going to do so, you're going to want an armature to do it. Just don't do it like that and sausage roll it. But that's the idea right there. So moving on, there it is, some plant wire. And I wrapped it around, and there's a the basic shape of the energy. And then I dry fit it to make sure that it goes into place. And you see how it's coming from there. It's swirling around and going to... Uh, the base of the mortise engine, and that's the idea. So, I'm going to use some more material, which is a first for me. It's the first time for me use actually creating an armature. Well, first things first, I want to glue it into place and make sure it doesn't move around on me. I think I use more zip kicker as well to keep that into place. And I'm using a substantial amount because it seems that this is a weak area. And I want to make sure that it was weak. And then I took a little dowel there and I wiped off the excess. I didn't want too much glue there. Um, I wanted to get into the cracks uh, and crevices, nooks and crannies uh, of the middle there, um, just so I can have be a solid piece. But at the same time, I didn't want it to go all over the place. So, wait for it to dry. And here I have a little Plano case where I keep uh, a lot of my basing materials and little tubes. Uh, just so I can have a variety, and I labeled each one. Um, I just took some, I guess some, 
labels that you can just get from Staples and stuff like that, uh, or any kind of office supply store, uh, Office Max, uh, or anything like that. And you can just write them in there. I can write small. I like writing small. I've always liked writing small. Um, I wear glasses because I can't really see far away, but seeing close up is great for me. So I can see small details. I can always read um, a fine print. A uh, little, what the watch says is, it says inside the dials and stuff like that. I always be able to read that. And I hurt my eyes because I was playing video games on a very old TV and I was sitting too close to the TV. Today we use monitors and we don't have that problem, but back in the day, in the uh, in 80s, the TVs were not really safe. You didn't want to sit too close to it. So I was playing Atari back then, dating myself, and I got way too close. My brother said, uh, my little, little brother said that he had a high score and I wanted to beat it because uh, there was a lot of rivalry there. And intensely I played for hours upon hours this one game until I actually beat it. I think it was Galaga or something like that. And uh, I actually beat it. And I beat his outrageous score that he said, and I found out that he was lying. He didn't even get the million points in which he said that he had. And I played for hours upon hours until I beat it. But I was intensely close to the TV, and I ruined my eyes forever. Thanks, bro. Thanks, man. That's right. All right, so... <laughs> so, um, that gave me the ability to see small things, though, so thank you there. And uh, I never turned back ever since I, I, I loved small miniature things because of that, because I can see them very well. I wonder if I got laser surgery, if I could still see small things. Would it ruin my ability to work uh, on miniatures? So what I did over there is I put some stone in. I had some gravel that I got free from the side of the road. And it is amazing. If you ever see gravel that looks like sand, scoop up some. Yeah, because you have a variety of sizes there that you can use, and it seems to be, the, for me, the right scale for miniatures. And then just glue them onto the base. I know I did a base coat there, but I'm going to base coat it again. Um, so here I'm using Liquitex. Um, I have gel medium there, and I have Liquitex paste. Uh, first, I was going to do gel medium for the river in the middle, and then I decided against it. I, I stick with the paste. All paste. Ultimately, and this is pretty good molding paste, uh, sculpting paste, and it's very liquidy, uh, but when it dries, it dries uh, very pasty, and I'm mixing it in with just a little bit of water there just to, um, to thin it out just a little bit so it's easier for me to work with. And all I'm doing is dabbing it along the uh, metal armature that I made from the plant wire. And as it dries, I kind of lip it up in certain areas and really glob it on in layers and building it up slowly. And it dries relatively quickly. I mean, not instantaneous, but still, you know, within, uh, I guess it was like five, ten minutes, I was able to manipulate it a little more. And another ten minutes, it was, uh, it was fully, basically fully dry, uh, not paintable. I think I, uh, after I finished sculpting it, I waited till the next day before I painted it. So I'm not sure exactly when it was when it fully cured and dried, but I didn't want to take any chances. At this level, I glued everything on there with the armatures, uh, and I have everything selected, and I actually built it up to the point where I was really happy with the results. So I didn't want to take any chances knowing how clumsy I was by ruining it due to impatience. So I was patient, and I worked, it on, I worked on something else at the time. Uh, while I waited for this to completely cure and dry. So this is all it takes, you see there, uh, just slowly dabbing some pieces on. And as I'm dabbing it, you see it stick to the little uh, sculpting device that I got there. And I actually created little lips, so little ripples of energy that were kind of like flowing through this. Um, and I thought it was the coolest thing. This is the first time working with this paste, and I was very, very happy. Now, one thing you do have to worry about when you put it on like this is that if you put, if make it too top-heavy, gravity will start bringing it down and down, and it'll just sag on the bottom. Uh, one way to resolve that, if you want it to stick straight up, is to turn the thing upside down on the edge. Uh, just make sure it's secure, and gravity will pull everything towards the top. Or 
Uh, make sure it's dry. Don't put too, don't make it too heavy. Wait till it's dry mostly, and then add another layer on top. So you're doing it in layers where one needs to be dry. It's sort of like glazing. You want to wait for the last glazing layer to dry before you're adding any more onto it. Yeah. If not, just mixes in. So working with this paste, I have to say A plus. Really, it it really met whatever I was expecting and exceeded the expectations. I was I was thinking it might fail on me, but look at the way it looks. There goes that energy coming out. That's exactly what I wanted. Uh, and I just had to cover the entire uh, the plant wire. So this way it can look more like realistic and that ghostly energy. The same energy as coming off the uh, the mortise engine. I wanted to replicate that, and but it's coming from this orb. And it was really, really important for me. So, and I thought it was very, very successful how it came out. Super happy. Super happy. So, you know, try it. And if you try it, uh, let me know what you think. If you ever wanted to create like an energy coming up from a field, try it with the armature and then work with the paste. You can get Liquitex at AC Moore uh, and at uh, Hobby Lobby and at Michael's. So they all sell Liquitex products. Uh, and you're looking for the modeling paste. Uh, they have the gel medium, which I still I still want to use for. Um, gosh, I still want to use it for the for lava lava bases, which uh, Mr. Vince Ventrilla did on his hobby cheating videos, which I love, by the way. So what I'm doing here is I'm putting a lip. I'm using the modeling paste to put a lip at the edge of the stonework so this way uh, it doesn't look completely flat and even it looks more like rock. And again, this was a suggestion done by the PMP, Painters Motivating Painters, uh, and suggestions that really helped me out and really make it look a little more realistic. So I played around. Again, the only regret that I had was that I didn't continue the the modeling paste all the way to the bottom, sealing the bottom so this way the uh, water effects wouldn't seep through, which made a mess, by the way, <laughs> total mess. So again, if you're doing rock, rock is not even at the edges and flat on the edges, so you kind of just want to build it up. Modeling paste worked perfectly for this. And it was kind of fun to work with. Now, after having the success from the energy coming from the top, just Gently tapping it here and there created ridges, and as it dried, it was easily to manipulate and create points. And you can just add it wherever you want to build up spaces. Uh, there's no real science to you know forming rock. It's just whatever's clever and whatever works. So I put a little here and there, a little everywhere. It's just uneven, as rocks are in nature. Uh, my the problem with this was with the food filler and I sanded it down it became completely flat and that's just not realistic now if I was doing a street uh, and then even then sometimes if a street is cracked but if it's a brand new street or you know metal that wasn't bent in any shape or form then I'm gonna want to sand that down but since it was since it was rock I want to kind of build it up and I put a glob of rock there for no reason in particular just so that it wouldn't be even and I played around with the paste, and it was a lot of fun. A lot of fun to work with this. This is a first for me. I never used the modeling paste before. So it was a lot of first. Uh, using skulls was a first. Building stuff up. Uh, creating uh, with paste was a first. Um, even using the, the tombstones. I never used those tombstones before. So using that was a first. Uh, a lot of first here. Using the textured paint before using the primer was a first as well. So I really did, I'm happy about all the things that were a first for me and creating new things. And what I always say that painting is a journey, so you can't really embark on a journey if you're not discovering new things along the way and taking chances. And hey, you know what, sometimes I'm gonna fail and I'm okay with that, and that's fine with me. Um, I know I'm not perfect, so, <laughs> so that's fine. And while making a mistake, as long as if you make the mistake, you learn from the mistake and do it better next time, then it's, it's all gravy. Yeah.
It's all gravy. Don't get discouraged by making mistakes. You make mistakes, just, you know, build it up or play around with something else or, you know. I mean, can I say that I was never discouraged when I make a mistake? I can't say that. I can't say that I was never discouraged. But there have been times where a mistake led on to something I would never have tried before and that discovery was so worth the mistake. You know, so you never know what's going to happen down the road uh, and what inspires you. Whatever doesn't work for the base that you're working on or whatever doesn't work for the miniature you're working on may work for a miniature down the road. So if you tried something and it doesn't look right for what you're doing, it might work later on. So you never know. You never do know. So every time you make a miniature or create one of these things, um, you're, you just learn from each experience. Try something new. See if you like it and see if you don't. If you don't like it, then you know not to use it for that particular application again. And try to figure out a ways that you can use it in a different application. I'm still trying to learn how to use Vallejo Liquid Mask for something. I'm not there yet, so I don't know what I'm going to use it for just yet. I definitely do not want to use it for masking ridges, maybe flat surfaces. But honestly, if I am doing that, then uh, it really worked out with uh, Silly Putty. So I just usually just use Silly Putty, and it usually usually helps. Now, if you had an Aquila on top of a, a chest of armor plate that's basically flat all the way around, maybe you may want to use it for that. I was told to use it very thickly around there, which limits the control. And then, you know, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to still work on it until I can find uh, a use for it because I bought it. So, dag nabbit, I'm going to use it. Again, just putting a block, building up uh, what I thought was going to be a grave. Um, but it never even worked out that way. I kind of just created a hill, which is cool because later on I put some basing material on there and it just created an uneven surface. You don't want it to look even, so just building it up here and there, that works. Again, going on the tips, gravity kind of pulled it down and I wanted to make a lip there, so I just made a lip. And you can continue it on, you can make the lip as high as you'd like it. But uh, I just wanted just enough to differentiate to know that it's stone and not a flat surface. So working with Liquitech model paste was definitely a cool experience for me because it really worked very well for the application that I wanted. I'm really happy that I've gotten that and I got it on sale. So it's amazing. Always try to get your stuff on sale. You don't want to pay full price for anything. So try to get things on sale because, you know, Unless your budget's unlimited, which mine definitely is not. And, um, you know, I have Mel the Terrain Tutor in the back. If you haven't seen Mel the Terrain Tutor, he's pretty awesome. He's a really cool guy. Uh, support him on Patreon if you can. Um, he really has great ideas when it comes to terrains and stuff and, and things like that. So, I mean, I'll, I love the, his ideas, and he's pretty amazing. Uh, and he's, you know, he's a dad. So, you know, he's older like me, so I really relate to him. Um, go Mel. Big shout out, Mel. Mel the Terrain Tutor. Check out his channel, Terrain Tutor. He's in the UK. I never met him. Maybe one day I'd be able to meet him. That would be cool, too. Um, really looking forward to Nova Open this year. Uh, uh, hopefully, I'm not going to jinx it, but I'm not going to say anything. But there's a certain somebody who I might meet. Oh my God, I'm such a klutz. Look at that. See? I told you I'm a klutz. But there's a certain somebody I might meet and um, I don't know. I'm ecstatic. I'm ecstatic. I don't know what to say. I'm, I'm starstruck and I've never been starstruck before. And believe me, I met I met Madonna. I met, uh, who else did I meet? Robert De Niro. Who else did I meet? Uh, I met the Wu-Tang Clan. I met Method Man for, for rap artists fans out there in the uh, mid 90s and I met quite a few people in New York when I lived in New York because back then you know it doesn't matter because the millionaire is the guy in the jeans right next to you with the hole in, in his jeans and the reason he's a millionaire because he didn't spend his money on expensive stuff you know so <laughs> so yeah so it didn't really impress me uh back then but right now I don't know I'm starstruck <laughs> anyway anyway enough about that that's going to be later on you know, um, I'll tell you the details after Nova Open, which uh, I'm hoping to 
include something in Nova Open. I'll, I'll give, uh, I'll record Nova Open and give you feedback and report upon uh, what it's like. For me, in my experience, my very first um, gaming convention. I've never been to one, so super stoked for that. Uh, there's no open, and, and I registered for PAX Unplugged. And PAX is the Penny Arcade, and it's usually have to do with uh, video games and stuff like that. A lot of video game YouTubers go to PAX, PAX East, PAX West. Um, but this is PAX Unplugged, and it's in my area. So Unplugged meaning board games and stuff like that, and uh, non-collectible miniature games. And uh, I'm really excited to check out what it's like. So from never going to a convention in my life to actually meeting a hero and uh, <laughs> and um, actually experiencing too, what a change, you know? And honestly, if I didn't start doing the uh, miniatures paintbrush, I would have never gone to these things. I've never experienced any of these things. So, you know, I'm feeling blessed right now. I'm feeling blessed just to share it with you. So right now what I'm doing is I I, um, I covered it again with primer, I, that off camera. And now I'm just getting some earth colors here. Uh, just playing around with different kinds of browns. And I usually put washes on, so I just tone it down a bit. Getting the edges and painting in the river, uh, I get uh, pestle and flesh, I believe that is, uh, a rotted flesh. And I put that in the middle for, the, for a base. And I build it up. I want to make it lighter in the middle. And I played around with a lot of different greens here. I, I mean, I don't know what to say. I went over it many, many times. Different kind of greens, different kind of uh, look to it. I wanted to get it glowing, but I didn't want it to be the same color as the mortise engine. That is definitely, so I stood away from the flat green completely, you know. Um, and if I used some uh, livery green or scorpina green, uh, I used it and I cut it with a pestle and flesh or something like that. So a necrotic flesh. So I never used it straight. Uh, just so I can have a different tonal variation. Also, I wanted the colors on the base to be somewhat muted because I wanted the mortise engine to be showcased, so I didn't want the base to steal the show. I wanted the base to be muted while the mortise engine has that bright scorpion green with the uh, popping purples that I had in there, so your eyes get, yeah, yeah, cool base, but wow, look at the miniature. You know, and that's what I wanted to do was showcase the miniature. Tell a story with the base, tell a story with the miniature. Um, and as an artist, if you do want to have people really look at uh, your piece, you want it You want it that when they look at the first time, they're kind of shocked and amazed and it draws their eyes to it. But as they keep looking at it, they see more and more details and more and more of the story unfolds. And that's why if you ever go to the museum, you see people staring at artwork and staring at artwork. And so artwork hasn't changed. It's just they're noticing more and more details to it. So they're actually studying it and then admiring like each each item within the, the painting itself had a reason behind it. And that's what I try to convey. Like when I paint a miniature or a base, I want to tell a story. So everything I, I try to do is I try to, to make it intentional. So I have a reason for everything. Um, and, and I try to do that. And when you do that, you actually have a story that you want to tell. And hopefully you get to convey it or feel really, really confident in how you convey it. So... Okay, so I'm going over the ridges right now. I kind of want the ridges to be a little lighter than everything else because when it hits the water, I, I figured it's like a little bit out of the water and trying. So whatever pestle and flesh is going to be is going to be a little bit lighter on the edges. And then I do lighter in the middle and then I use spots in the middle where it's even lighter than that. And I slowly build it up. So edges, stripe in the middle, and then highlights in the middle. And that's pretty much what I did. And I did not clean out the uh, airbrush throughout there. So one color blended into the next color, blended into the next color. So as I'm adding different colors in there, uh, it's blending in with the last color, so it has a transition. So and that's the first time I did it. If I wanted to blend some colors uh, and I wanted to slowly build a highlight or build a gradient, what I'm doing is layering in the colors, but building in the gradient slowly, 
but surely adding one more drop of the different color before it gets lighter and lighter so it can have that glowing effect. And I keep on doing that until I achieve the effect that I'm comfortable with. So I keep going over back and forth until I'm happy with it. Basically, that's all I did. Okay. And those are the undercolors. I have full intention of putting um, Woodland Scenics, Realistic Water. I hear epo epoxies are pretty good. Uh, also a cheap alternative to that. But since I've already gotten the Realistic Water from a Woodland Scenics, which is a bit more on the expensive side, I kind of want to use it, you know? <laughs> I don't want it to go to waste or anything like that. So yeah, I'm going to use that up where I can. Again, the sides and then the middle. And that's what I'm building up. And I'm just playing around with stuff. Honestly, with these bases and everything that I'm doing, um, it's more of a painting chat. So it's not like I tried everything, I know it works, and I'm going for it. <laughs> I'm discovering while I'm filming. So I'm like, oh, okay, this is cool, or that's better, or this is that. And I'm playing around with it, and I kind of like it. I like this format personally because I feel like I'm, you know, you're hobbying or you sh uh, you could be hobbying right now and I'm hobbying at the same time. It's like we're working together, you know, and we're just hobbying together because I know that I watch YouTube videos while I hobby and I listen to podcasts when I hobby. So this way, you know, I can hear stories and I feel like I'm doing more. I don't really listen to books while I hobby. I kind of listen to audio books while I drive to work because my commute is a bit long. About 40 minutes or so. So it's not too bad, but at the same time, it still is pretty long. So, you know, I get to listen to my audio books there. So when I'm not reading, I'm listening to books. And when I'm not listening to books, I'm listening to podcasts. And when I'm not listening to podcasts, I'm watching my favorite YouTubers and the hobby. Um, and if you look at the subscription, I have subscriptions to all the YouTubers that I, I, I subscribe to and I watch. So uh, you can check out the subscriptions that I have here on the channel. And you can check out the ones that I like myself. Uh, big shout out to all of them, which are awesome. So here I am. I finished the lake for the most part. I think I had a couple more details. I'm not sure. Uh, but for the most part, I'm happy with the lake. Uh, and now I'm going for the crystal ball, lowering down the PSI, getting a slower range, again, experiencing a ton of tip dry. But I don't mind the tip dry as much as long as I got the coverage that I wanted and I got the effect that I wanted with that crystal ball. Again, using the flat green. And then I build it up with the Scorpina green, and then I build that up on top of there with a flat yellow uh, being the uh, extreme highlight color. I could have gone to a white, but I didn't want to go to white. I hardly ever go to, to a white. So slowly building that up. And if it got a little bit on the bricks, I don't mind, because then it's going to have that uh, OSL effect, uh, source lighting, other source lighting than straight above. Uh, and then it's generating a little bit of that... Uh, of that glow onto the brick itself. So I didn't mind, again, no masking, um, which is something new. Usually it takes me hours to mask, but you know, time is that commodity you can't get back. Um, so if I can shave off some time in creating the miniatures, I will. I don't know how the effect's gonna turn out, but hopefully it's decent. Uh, I, I think it came out all right. Could I do better? Sure. Am I going to do better? Absolutely. Uh, as I do more miniatures, the better I get at certain things. And if I'm getting better than this, then that's not so bad for me, you know? <laughs> and I'm always, uh, again, pushing myself. So I will enter as many competitions as I possibly can to push myself to do things that I normally wouldn't do. I normally wouldn't do this mortise engine because it's the biggest miniature I ever tried. And honestly, I was completely intimidated. So if it wasn't for the competition on the PMP, I would have not done this mortise engine and it would have been year three and I still wouldn't have gotten the star collecting box completed. Sad, I know, but you know, it made me brave. So, you know, I agree. If you're in a competition, then you know, you're there to show up, you know, you're going to show up and you're going to give your best. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm giving my best. So I can't do it anymore. I can't do it anymore. I'm going down, my friend. I'm going down now. All right, so there's going to be a couple parts where you're going to see the bottom of the base, which is not painted. Um, only because the angles I needed to get to. And again, recording with a camera in front of you isn't the easiest thing to do. 
uh, especially when you want to kind of get close like I'm doing right there. But for the most part, I try to keep everything in the camera range so you can see everything that I am doing and that you can rep replicate that. Again, you can do the same thing with different colors. That's cool uh, if you want to or have different kind of effects or use a, use a, uh, a brick or maybe use a statue and have all those glowing effects coming from a statue or something in statue's eyes or whatever you want to do. Uh, I use a ball, a crystal ball, on a little tower, but you can use it and build up anything that you really want and have fun with it. Make it your own, you know? So, you know, as I'm discovering, we're discovering together. So it's pretty cool. Okay, so just like jewels, you kind of want to have the entrance point of the light and the exit point of the light. So you put uh, one light in on one side and then one light in on the other side. And then you highlight one of those sides. So extreme high light. I could have done a, a white on the other side, but I didn't. So that's what we're going to do there. We're going to just add a highlight on one and then add a highlight on the other. But right now, we're doing the flat green. So I'm going to go and try to flat green as much as I possibly can on the actual energies. And I don't want the energy to be all flat green, so I kind of left one end uh, liberated. And then I paint Scorpion green on top of that. All right, so now we're going for that effect, which is flat green to scorpina green on all the little items that we painted up in the last episode of uh, the Mortis engine. So just going from green to black and no masking, which is something I've never done before. So again, pushing myself to the limit and trying to learn brush control when it comes to airbrushing uh, and trying to get better with that as well. And all in all, I think it came out pretty well. I really like the effects of how it came out. All the pieces were done. So it was kind of fun putting together these miniatures and putting together these videos for you. Uh, if you haven't noticed, I do have a new intro that I created with the help of my buddy Garrett Atkins, who uh, is really amazing and very talented. He has his own... YouTube channel where he does a lot of shenanigans as a uh, graduated teen who is uh, trying to start a band and go to college and you know, I really wish him the best. He's pretty amazing uh, to offer his music for this channel. Check him out. He is amazing and he's very, 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 very talented up and coming and uh, artist and, you know, I really do appreciate that you know you help out the channel and um, donate his talents to the channel. Check him out, Garrett Atkins. All right. Now here's the part where I show you the bottom of the base because that's what you need to see. <laughs> Not really. Base is made in China. I know this. Now, so now we're going back to the Scorpina green and we're just getting all the areas we didn't get with the flat green and kind of try to transition one to the other so it can look like the mortise engine. Um, and has that transition of that uh, necrotic kind of power coming through there, having that green flame. I'm going to hit the camera a couple times, but that's okay. Um, and show you the bottom of the, of the base again. <laughs> I try to move it around as much as possible, so I do apologize if I don't get the, all the camera angles right. But... Uh, But it was fun to watch this come to life. I had an idea, and it came out exactly the way I wanted to, and that rarely happens. So what I'm doing is building up the entry light, where the light is coming from, and uh, where it's exiting. I'm going to hit the bottom end, so hitting one end to the other, just like you would if you are painting a jewel. You get the entry point and exit, exit point of the light. Again, using a lot of very low PSI, I think going down to 12 or 10, uh, which means a ton of tip dry, which is okay. It's okay. Um, because when it's diluted, uh, it's not so, so bad. But uh, still, you get to do the effect that you want, and you have the control that you want, and you don't have the overspray. So, hey, it's worth it. It's a small price to pay for the effect that you get, which is pretty neat. I have to say the whole process, this whole process has been amazing uh, for me. 
Again, starting this miniature, I did not have the confidence to think that I'd be able to pull it off and actually finish the miniature. That's why it sat on my shelf. That's why I did the hex rates and all the other stuff, and I was like, oh, I'm not sure I'm gonna do this more extension, so. So, I mean, I still have I still have the Skeleton Horde, which has a Vargeist. And uh, I still have, uh, yeah, I'm gonna dry fit right here. I still have the, uh, wait, Skeleton Horde has, oh yeah, one of the Mortarks. Yeah, I don't even know how I'm gonna do the skulls on that thing, but uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, that's pretty intimidating. And then the Vargeist is really intimidating in the Vamp uh, Flesh Eater Quartz. And then, of course, I have Nagash. <laughs> Which, you know, working and seeing the Crystal Rush uh, last year uh, online, uh, and you see the tribute to Nagash, and you say, my gosh, that Nagash was pretty amazing. So I don't know. And uh, he customized all that stuff, and I've never customized anything. So when it comes to the Primaris Marines, Space Marines, that I'm going to do is Space Wolves, there's going to be some customization there, and I am going to probably have a couple of heart attacks. But you're not going to push myself. I'm going to push myself because you're worth it, and I want to improve. And if I don't push myself, I won't improve. If I'm always afraid I'm going to make a mistake, when I make a mistake, I'm going to fail and not learn from the mistake and quit. And it's not about quitting. It's about uh, continuing on as much as you possibly can and surviving through the thick of it and pushing yourself forward. And that's what it's all about. Pushing yourself forward and getting better. Now, one thing I'm not going to show you here on this video, first of all, because it's going to be super long and I already went through three episodes, but more, more so than that, I'm going to actually, I'm thinking about creating a display um, I guess diorama for this where I insert all the pieces of the star collecting box in and that being the display uh, and then entering that in another competition coming up so that's what I'm thinking about doing so I'm learning about displays and how to do that so what I'm doing is uh, getting concrete slab and I'm just gonna go back and since everything on that uh, the plinth was all colored up by spraying the top piece. I'm just going back and hitting it with like, like a base coast concrete slab. Um, again, not completely covering it to the top because I do want to have that OSL effect, but uh, hitting the bottoms definitely and creeping my way up just a bit uh, right before I hit the top to, to see that it's a pillar and not just the free air brushing everywhere. You know, <laughs> define what areas is what. So, again, I get overspray here and there, and that's okay because I um, use a lot of Agrath's Earth Shade to tone everything down. I wanted to tone it down, and I do want to have some highlights. And if I had some overspray uh, with a gray, it'll create like um, a filter, that which I can put the uh, put the Agrath's Earth Shade on top of. And I do spray it, Agrath's Earth Shade and other kind of shades, just to give it. Uh, little variations, slight variations of color throughout the whole thing that you'd only have to keep looking at before you actually see it. You can't just see it at first glance. It's one of those things you have to stare at the model for a while to say, hey, there's purple on this rock, and there's a little green on this rock, and there's a little other things uh, that I added to, a little blue here and there to make it a little uh, different, make it colder. Uh, and I added all those things to the rock, uh, to the rock formations. So... We have all of those, which uh, I guess a coat of Agrax or shade here and there covered up some, but not all of those colors that are peeping through. So playing around with shades through an airbrush is interesting. You get very, very light coats, uh, almost glazes, glaze-like coats or candy-like coats that kind of shine through and the, the color is not dramatic whatsoever. It's kind of uh, dulled out and... Um, it created that subtle effect. Again, I didn't want stark contrast when it came to um, the base, only because uh, I wanted the Morris engine to take front and center 
when it comes to uh, the base. So now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to section off each piece of the river. Again, uh, learning this through hobby cheating, Vince Venturello when he made ice bases uh, way back in the day. And yes, I, I keep watching through all of them. And uh, I thought it was pretty neat, but I'm using a uh, rolling pin that I got from Green Stuff World to flatten it out, make it one cohesive piece. And I'm putting it around and it works out really well. Again, the only thing that didn't work out very well is that I should have puttied the bottom piece uh, and the bottom piece where it just wasn't secured in the bottom pieces. Um, it was secure where the, and that's a uh, poster tack. It was secure where the poster tack was, but it was not secure underneath the rock formations. And that, that water just seeped through. So just be careful if you're gonna use this, make sure that all the edges are sealed, completely 100% sealed, because water will find a way, path of least resistance, to get out and leak out. And, and it will, it will leak out. There'll be no ifs, ands, or buts about it. So be very, very careful. Also, when you're putting this on, you may wanna have a level, make sure that whatever your, um, whatever item you're putting it on is level. You may want to take a level because if it's not level, what you're going to end up with is it's going to look like thicker on one end and thinner on the other end. Important thing about scenic, a Woodland Scenics uh, Realistic Water, it says do not shake. Do not shake. So do not shake it. It's very simple. Right? You're just going to pour it without shaking, which is contradictory to everything else that I've ever used ever, like paint or anything else. Now I'm putting it in a little cup, so this way I can have a little more control of how I put it on to the base. Uh, and I'm going to cover it up so it doesn't dry out. Uh, I'm using a droplet, uh, a dropper. And you can pick up these droppers from, you know, science kits, or um, you can pick them up at a hobby store. Um, a lot of different places you can pick this up. If you have like a teacher store that has a hobby kit with science, uh, see if they have any droplets. Uh, you don't want to pay full price for that. Uh, and I used it. I kind of got rid of all the bubbles I possibly could and just go for... Uh, injecting it in there and into the little cup and then just having the control of putting it where I want to put it which is really awesome you know I guess I could have poured it out which is fine uh, if you want to do that but if you want to exert a little more control you put it like that and you don't want to put it like very very thick layers uh, you don't want to put very very thick amount of water here uh, you want to build it up in layers, so just put a thin amount just to cover the bottom, let it dry, and then put another if you want to thicken it up. Um, so you're going to build it up in layers. In fact, for the amount that I need, I put too much water into the cup. So, you know, there's something to consider. So yeah, this actually became a mess when it started leaking out. So I had to do this twice, but you know, I just repeated the procedure after I sealed up everything and made sure that it wasn't going to leak. But uh, was I discouraged? A little bit, I gotta admit. I was I was very discouraged that reaching this level and putting this amount of effort into it, that you know, it all collapsed. But I learned that you don't play around with uh, water bases like this. You do not play around. You want to seal it just like anything else with water. Seal it completely before moving on. But all in all, I mean, I think it came out really awesome. Like towards the end, after doing it the second time and putting more highlights in there, and this is the exact same technique that I used. You're not gonna see it leaking out here because it took like overnight before it leaked out. It took a long, long time. So you don't notice it right away which is kind of scary. <laughs> you don't really even know if you have everything sealed until after you have a, a mess on your hands. But all in all, and that's how it looks. And you just want to wet the bottom. That's all you want to do. And if you want to thicken it up, you can thicken it up later with another layer. That's pretty much it. I mean, it looks pretty cool right now. It's not seeping through right now, that's why. <laughs> but it looks pretty cool right now. And there you go. And this is it, it again. This time I sealed it, I sealed the bottom, and I did exactly the same thing again. And there you go, I'm just pulling off the poster tack. And it dried completely. I left it for two days to dry before I pulled it off. 
All right, so I've been 48 hours uh, before it dried. And I had a fan running for 48 hours, <laughs> pulling the air away from it. Uh, you can cover it at this point because if you, if you um, leave it uncovered while it's drying to a certain extent, you might have like dust that collects on the top of it. So if you do want like an ice base or something perfect, you may want to cover it. Mine wasn't really an ice base, so it didn't bother me too much. Right, I'm playing around with camera angles so you can see the mortise engine as I dry fit it onto here. I was super excited. Uh, I got the entire mortise engine built with all the pieces. All I did was put it together. Again, that was off camera. And there were several times where, you know, things didn't line up well. And I took it apart and put it back together again and was a little frustrated. And then put it back together again and then quit and not quit and then put it back together again. And then finally it, it came out and then I saw it through fruition. So now what I'm doing is playing around with uh, shades. I'm going shades through the airbrush just so I can have some control of where the shades are. And, you know, if I want to really hit an area that I want it to pull, then it'll pull on that area. I noticed that if you do it with airbrush, uh, you can control a little more, in my opinion, where you want things to pull and where you don't want them to pull. Have just to tone things down. Because the thing about Agrax Earth Shade, it makes everything dull, which I, I do like, uh, especially because I want to dull everything out here. Because, uh, again, I want the more ascendant to shine, so I don't want everything to be too bright. Plus, everything looks like muddy here, and I don't want it to look too muddy. I just want it to look like earth. And uh, I knew I was going to cover most of this. Now, if you see where I'm brushing right there, uh, I did put some green stuff there and some textured. I used the textured rollers to put some green stuff there. And I actually did a video about textured rollers. Um, so I'm going to link that. So you can see that as well, uh, about how to use textured rollers, and that was recent. Okay, just uh, some of the tips that I use. And as I'm building this, if I come across something that's a, a technique, I'm going to show you how I did it um, on the tip sections. Now, uh, I have videos every Wednesday. As far as the tips, those are bonuses that I do on the weekend if I have some time. Um, and, you know, because life happens. So I can't guarantee everything on the weekends, but sometimes I put two videos out on the weekends. I usually do a response to Vince Ventrilla's topic of the week, if I can, if I have experience uh, with that topic and uh, I, I, I'm able to respond. I try to respond every time I possibly can. Uh, and then I usually try to have a uh, painting or hobby tip uh, on Fridays uh, if I can. Again, life happens sometimes, and when I'm in the classroom, if I have to grade papers all weekend and I don't have time to put a video, then it's just not going to happen, you know? Um, but I'd like to, and if I can, I will. For sure, I will be here creating videos. And so far, so good, you know? So far, so good. It's been really good that I've been able to produce videos, uh, painting tips as I come across things. I'm like, hey, this would be a neat idea for a painting tip. I'm going to do that. And then, you know, uh, some um, people that watch the show give me ideas as well. Adam, you know, you always, uh, you inspire me to do certain things uh, and certain shows and your suggestions are listened to as a suggestion to all people who are watching and, and you know, make comments and are active about that. So I think it's really cool uh, that you guys are engaged, which makes it makes it feel like a community and what I'm doing here makes it feel worthwhile. Um, again, I do this because I want to share with you guys and, you know, right now it's not profit profitable for me. It's just, you know, something I like doing and I like sharing and I like community and I like expressing. So this is my art and I'm trying to express it, even videotography. Uh, I'm playing around with that as well, and I'm getting better. I'm not just getting better at doing miniatures. I'm getting better at doing YouTube videos, and that's what I wanted to do. Constantly improving. I kind of try to be a renaissance person and have more than one ability that I'm good at and perfect those as much as possible and be really good at different things. And I think that's really important to be a well-rounded person. Okay, so Agrax Earthshade is on, and then I come back... Um, and I play around with different colors. Again, different shades I use. Uh, Agrax are shades. I use sepia. 
uh, Serapon Sepia, I use uh, Cola Green Shade, I use uh, Dot Tree Purple, or, yeah. And I use, I, they're in the beginning, they're in the first video actually. Uh, all the ones that I used, I don't have them in front of me right now, so. But I best show them. There's Coley uh, Green Shade. I want to add some green to it. And I'm just playing around with colors. That's all I'm doing is playing around with colors, putting them here and there, and making it really subtle. You know, that all these things are different colors. You have to look really, really carefully. So if you ever look at this up close, you may not notice at first glance because that mortise engine is Pam right in your face, you know? <laughs> so I didn't want it to be uh, so stated. I wanted it to be understated. So that's why I did very, very light shades. And I figured using the shade wouldn't be so pronounced when I used it. So, you know, it'll show, but it won't be overwhelming. And that's the idea behind using the shades and using it in this manner. I've never used it in this manner before. So, you know, it's an experience for me. Again, any of the any of the uh, shade that I didn't use, I pour it right back into the bottle, you know, only because I don't have it out long enough that it's drying in there. So I guess I like pour it out. Any part that's drying is towards the bottom or towards the tip of the brush and not in the container. And I make sure that it's not again oxidized for too long that it dries out. So and it seems to you know I, I seem to actually conserve more shade. By using that, I mean, if you know, anybody who knows who buys these pots, these pots aren't uh, exactly the cheapest ones on the market, but they perform so well. Um, and I really do like it, again, with the airbrush, I like putting it on. Can you do this with the, uh, with the regular brush? Absolutely. Absolutely. And without a doubt, you can just use it. You can use these uh, shades as medium as well. Because basically, uh, these shades are Lamian median with color. That's all. I guess it's food color or something like that. I don't know, some pigment too there. And um, that's all it is. All right, using dirt, dirt tree violet. I am saying that wrong. I know I am. I do apologize. Um, and again, just tying that in. Got the brown, got the green, and I want to put some purple in there. Um, just to liven up the colors a little bit, you know. They are understated, and they do get lost in translation unless you really, really look at it. Now, right now, since everything is bright and colorful, you can see them. Put that right next to the mortise engine, it disappears. It disappears. That mortise engine really just hogs up the spotlight, which is exactly what I wanted it to do, uh, which is perfect. You know, I want you to notice the base, but at the same time, I don't want it to be center stage. I posted these pictures up, the pictures of the finished mortise engine, and a lot of people said they really loved the base and they, they said it was outrageous and all this other good stuff. So I got a lot of compliments on that. But a lot of people, uh, more people noticed the miniature itself, which is awesome. So um, I'm happy that I got compliments on it and validates what I'm doing. Um, I, I, I keep looking at this and after a while, all I can see are the mistakes. And I know it's it's okay, it's better than what I've ever done. It's the best miniature I've ever done so far. Um, and every miniature that I do is the best miniature I've ever done so far because I'm always improving. So last miniature isn't gonna be as good as the current miniature that I'm doing. And that's just the way it works out. Okay, so there's a light at the end of this tunnel. Uh, we got about 10 more minutes left, uh, maybe not even. And we will be done. Uh, I think it's about time we take this oh, moment of truth, taking the actual miniature. They spend over a month and a half putting together and shaving and painting and putting together and trying to glue together. I'm shaving off and cutting areas. And as I fit it, for some reason, didn't line up properly did not line up properly. So what I did was, is that I took some green stuff and I actually put it onto the base and I lifted one end so it could be straight. Again, you want it to look straight and I did it by eye and that's just the way it, it worked out. You know, it was one of those last minute frustrating things that happened that you just kind of overcame. So I'm putting the glue on, I'm putting it on and that's when I, lo I look and I see that it's not even. Uh, and it's scary because I have that, uh, I had the zip kicker there to accelerate the drying once I got it onto place. But I put it onto place, I looked at it, I didn't like the way it looked. I actually chopped up, literally chopped up the green stuff that I put onto the base because that started hindering exactly where I wanted it to be. So here's where I noticed that it's just not right and it's just not gonna work. So 
Um, what do I do? Uh, I chop off and I use that because I couldn't find, and I felt like hurried because when I put glue on things, I guess it doesn't just, like zip kicker doesn't just accelerate the drying time of, um, drying time of super glue. It also accelerates the pitter patter of my heart because it's like, oh no, it's going to dry, it's going to dry, it's going to dry, and it's not going to go all right. And then what am I going to do? What am I going to do? So I cut out a piece there and I find that it's still not right. So I cut out even more piece here and there. And this is really dangerous because I am going at it at a rapid pace, cutting pieces out, just being daring and going for it. And everything could have gone wrong. Everything could have gone wrong, but um, thank God I was blessed and, 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 and it didn't go wrong. <laughs> so, so nervous and so reckless here. I do not recommend taking your uh, snap blade and start cutting off pieces of your base after putting hours upon hours upon hours upon hours upon days upon days upon days working on it just to chop it up, you know? <laughs> So, yeah, super lucky that it came out all right. Super, super lucky that it came out all right. But, uh, yep, it did come out all right. So I was just, like, really, really blessed that it came out all right. And um, when all is said and done, after chopping it up and chopping it up and chopping it up and, and setting it down, I noticed that it wasn't even. Like, the left-hand side was higher than the right-hand side, and I just couldn't have that. I could not have that. It was like, no <clears throat> no way, Jose, or whatever your name may be. <laughs> no way wasn't going to happen. So finally, you, you look at there, I have some neat tight green stuff that I put on there, and I lift it up and I made it even. All right, next I am going to take the skulls, which I painted uh, skull white, and I'm putting some Agrax Earthshade. I also textured them with that texture paint that I used before from Kytalon. Uh So I painted them all together, and it looks like it's all dirtied up. And I, I chose to do that with a brush and not with a, um, oh, I'm sorry, those are oil washes. My bad. That was not Agrax or Shade. Those are oil washes, which I do love, love, love oil washes. They're amazing and so much better, in my opinion, than using the shades from, um, from just about any line. I don't like using shades from any line to bring it down or, or dip my models and stuff because it just dulls everything out. But with oil wash, it's, it just gets recesses. And if you overdo it, you can always use some mineral spirits and wipe down the areas that you don't want it to be so dark and it just reactivates it. So here it is. Here it is. I'm putting some kitty litter onto the bottom. Just putting some glue on there with a little stick, a little dowel that I got there. Um, I think the, it's called wood pile, and I'm just putting some I'm putting some kitty litter to simulate some rocks, and that's something I did for the spirit hosts, and I kind of want to continue it because I you know you, you kind of want to have the same thing in your army to have that cohesiveness. So whatever you did on the first one, you kind of want to do it in the last one, which is hard for me because then I find new methods and new things, and um, again it's non clumping kitty litter. I don't want to use clumping. Uh, non-clumping kitty litter and just pouring it on top after I just used uh, a little bit of PVA glue, which I, I didn't even, I don't think I watered down. When did I water down? Maybe one drop of water or two just to make it flow better. But that's pretty much it. I kind of want it sort of thick. And, you know, then I just, um, I washed it out with a black wash and I put some woodland, no, not woodland scenics. WWS, which I forgot what that meant. Again, it's not in front of me, sorry. Uh, and I just looked up Tufts, and I got it on Amazon. I just looked up Tufts. I was looking for any kind of Tufts that I could find. I was looking actually looking for uh, Army Painter, but I got WWS. Again, I don't know what that really sound that, that stands for uh, at the moment. There it is. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Freeze frame that. <laughs> And you'll see where I got there from. And it's just Tufts. This is the first time I've ever used a Tuff. So, and I heard they were pretty excellent. So I'm just going to put it on that first bridge where the skulls are towards the other end. Because it just seemed too plain and I want to add to it. And there it is. All you have to do is take off the Tuff and put it on. It was so easy. Really, really, really easy to do. Um, I was very, very happy with that that result. Uh, also, with the after I put some um, wash onto the rocks... 
Uh, what I did is took the flocking, the flocking that I used for all the other miniatures that I have within the line, which is from uh, Gale Force 9. And it says spring flocking. And I just put like little drops of glue on the rock itself. And I just sprinkled, um, I sprinkled the flocking throughout. So I just had patches of uh, grass throwing through the rock after I did the washes in the rock and dry brushed the rock just a little bit with a uh, with concrete slab. Okay, so now all I'm doing is toning down the reds and doing, just doing final details. And what you notice too, what I noticed while doing a miniature like this, there are things you overlook. There are so many things going on in the miniature that there are going to be things that you overlook. Like I didn't put verdigris on some of the weaponry, uh, like the reds came out too red, so I toned it down. Um, uh, like doing the little rivets on each one of the horses, which I could have done earlier, but you know I just didn't think about it at the time. Uh, and I'm using a, uh, it was pale aluminum to bring out those highlights of the rivets throughout the entire miniature. And I went through every one. Now, one thing you notice is the hands and how I'm holding it. I hold one hand to hold my wrist and I hold the other hand and I lean it up against the table uh, itself. And I exhale when I do a job because I learned watching uh, American Sniper that when you exhale, uh, you have more control than when you inhale. So there is that. All right, so this is the miniature, and it is done. It's never really done, but it's done to where I'm happy with it. And um, there you go. Woohoo! Time for celebration. Give me that thumbs up. You, you, you. It's all good. Man, oh man, that was a long journey, but so well worth it. And finally, I finished all the malignants in the Star Collectings box for my Death Army, which is awesome. And I feel so relieved that I finally got one of those boxes completed. Although, on and off, I was working on it, not working on it, working on it, not working on it some more for about two years now. Yeah, I'm guilty of that. But I'm glad I got this moment to share it with you here on the miniatures paintbrush. Well, I'll catch you next time, and if you like the video, please press that thumbs up. Uh, if you want to keep abreast of more tutorials slash chats and other shenanigans that are going on within the channel, hit the subscribe button. Uh, hit, there is a notification button right next to the subscribe button, so if you ever want to get alerted to when I post a new video, which is every Wednesday, and then on the weekends if I have some specials. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed, and I can't wait to see you next time on the miniatures paintbrush.